podcast. I only just got here myself. Oh, Are you wearing leopard print? <laughs> oh, hang on a minute. I haven't. Uh, I can't hear you. Wait a second. Uh oh. Uh oh. Can you speak now? Hello. Oh, I think that's hello, okay. Hello, hello, hello. Gosh, this you can hear it? stuff. Yeah, yeah, gotcha. Okay. Hi, everybody. Hi, Hi, Elle. How are you? I'm good. I got a haircut. You look fabulous. And you're wearing leopard print, I see. I'm wearing leopard for you. Thank and you. I Always right appreciated. Lips. Well, you are the queen of leopard. Uh huh. And the bright lipstick. Ooh. Ooh. Nice. You know, nice. Why not? <laughs> um, so okay. we're talking about. We're talking about. Sexual fantasies, and we got a lot of great questions. And in yeah, fact, yeah. Um, the first one I want to give uh, give you is kind of a long one. I'm going to read it, but it's a really good question. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I'm a cis woman. I've been with my husband, a cis man, for 16 years since we right. were both 19. We're 35 now. Mm. Married for six years. I discovered I'm bisexual almost two years ago, while we were exploring the lifestyle. She almost exclusively fantasizes about women and the type of porn she watches is lesbian porn, um, reads lesbian romance novels and short story erotica. Um, and uh, she is, uh, her husband seems a little uneasy with it, sometimes makes jokes asking if there's a man in the threesome, blah, blah, blah. Our sex life is great. I'm very attracted to him and men in general still. But um, she's explained to him that she thinks that she might be hyper-focused on lesbian content because she's passionate about exploring her identity, her new mm. identity, this new part of herself. Mm -hmm. um, and she started to feel a sense of shame, like she needs to scale back and watch more hetero content to balance herself out and maybe help reassure him. And she's not sure what to do. Mm. So, mm. It's a good question. Yeah. So, I mean, it sounds like the question is what to do, what to do about him, what to do about her. Yeah. Yeah. Like, she's yeah, I mean, feeling, she's feeling guilty for indulging this part of herself. And I think mm. she's feeling guilty because she's feeling like he's not sure what this means, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, you know, so she's in a relationship with him and then they're in the lifestyle or they were, they were which yeah. for people who are listening who don't know what that means that's that sort of code for the swing scene um so i'm gonna work on the assumption that they are in some sort of an open relationship i think that would be fair given that they go to swing parties yeah. you think or have in the past so would or have in the past yeah so so she's not saying that she wants to have sex with other women right now, right? No, she just wants to indulge this, uh, explore this new part of herself. Yeah. So the fantasy part, I mean, I see no problem with it at all. And, you know, as we've discussed in previous, you know, Friday afternoon discussions that we've had, what folks like to consume in terms of their porn consumption and what folks like to fantasize about is... It's certainly an indication of what turns you on, like for sure, that's a thing. But it doesn't necessarily indicate that you want to act on something or that it alters your identity necessarily. And so where she's talking about this, and she's not saying necessarily, I think I'm a lesbian, which is a very specific thing and, and has a lot of other kind of cultural and social implications that come with it. She's just saying that she fantasizes about women. She watches uh, lesbian-oriented mm -hmm. porn um, and lesbian erotica. And she, so, she identifies as bisexual. So And she identifies yeah. as bisexual, right. So, I mean, it sounds like really more than anything, the issue is not so much her fantasies. It's about reassuring her penis having man-identifying man husband mm -hmm. that he's still welcome. Mm -hmm. which, um, you know, I mean, that it's, it's understandable that he would be concerned about it and that he would think, you know, maybe she doesn't want me anymore. But there's nothing in this where she's saying she doesn't want him anymore. She's just saying right. this is sort of where her, her, you know, her compass is sort of heading erotically in that direction. But being married to somebody 
is so much more than just an erotic compass. There's so much more to it. So, and if their sex life is still satisfying, does she say anything about that? She did. That? She said remember. they have a great sex life. Right. So yeah. it really sounds like everything is okay. And more than anything, it's just going to be an opportunity to, you know, to reassure him probably on the regular mm -hmm. that he's wanted, that he's desirable. Um, and that if they're both open to the fact that that's part of her erotic template, mm -hmm. that she can have that and, and not have it take away anything from him would yeah. be my understanding. I mean, what do you think about that? I think, uh, I don't think she should feel a sense of shame, obviously. It's about her bisexuality and being attracted to women and erotically turned on by, by women. And I think that definitely having a conversation with him about this doesn't take away from you at all. I'm still yeah. incredibly attracted to you. I love our sex life, but this is a whole new dimension to me. And um, in fact, it only benefits you because now yeah, I'm really. thinking about a lot of things as opposed to just one thing. And um, just letting him know too, that it's a healthy part of a human being to want to look into that. And it's a healthy part of him a human part of him that is going to feel a little weird about it. So, yeah. so yeah, definitely reassuring him on the regular, as you say. Yeah. Yeah. That's the thing. And, and I think too, you know, because the cultural beliefs that a lot of us have is that, you know, when you find your, your partner, you know, your person, that that's the only person you have eyes for. Right. And the truth is for probably most people, the person who is your person, who is your yeah. partner, um, is not necessarily going to be the only person you have eyes for. And that does not mean that you're falling out of love with them. It doesn't mean that they're not the right person for you. It doesn't mean that you've made a mistake or anything like that. It just means that human sexuality is very, very nuanced and very textured and it changes through our lives. And it is possible to to you know be erotically attracted to more than one person at a time that that is part of the human condition mm -hmm. and it doesn't necessarily mean you love your partner any less it doesn't necessarily mean that you You're need to yeah, yeah. That, or that you you know you need to start calling a divorce lawyer it's got nothing right. to do with any of those things right. our our culture over the last couple of hundred years has conflated sex and love to the yeah. point that we can't see the distinction anymore. Yeah. And it's things like this that really drive it home, as it were, um, that there is a real difference between love and sex and they're complementary. You know, I often talk about them being like chocolate and red wine. They are delicious together, mm -hmm. but you can enjoy them equally by themselves. Yeah, that's good. Uh, mm. I love that question. Mm. Um, yeah, okay. thanks to whoever sent that one in. Yeah, that was great. Um, so we got a few of this question, which is, I fantasize about my ex or maybe someone else um, while my current partner is fucking me. Is mm -hmm. that toxic? Is mm -hmm. it okay to, um, to still lust over others when you're in love with... Um, with someone else yeah and that again i mean that's so common and i saw well like, we got so many responses about that like yeah. I, I still long for somebody from the past or somebody mm -hmm. you know somebody perhaps from the future right. um and it, again it comes back to this idea that that who we love and what we lust for what we long for what we desire are sometimes they are on the same page and then other times they are not on the same page for that day, that month, that year even. And it really comes down to, you know, within yourself, the degree to which you can sit with that, you know, the gap between these two things. So sometimes if, if you're sort of thinking, I need to think about this person or I need to think about that in order to get off, it doesn't mean that your partner is not desirable or they're not doing anything that, that's the right thing. I mean, it could mean that, you know, and then we have a slight, yeah. that's a separate issue. But yeah. because we're looking at this only through the fantasy lens today, mm -hmm. having fantasies about people other than your partner, first of all, it's not a red flag. It's not anything to worry about on its own. If 
you are noticing some other stuff that is going along with that, that you're no longer attracted to your partner, that you're looking for a reason to leave the relationship. That's different. Mm -hmm. But if you still feel like you're in the relationship, you're into your partner, the sex that you're having is good, pretty good or excellent, mm -hmm. then, you know, that's a lot of boxes to tick about why this is yeah. a relationship worth saving and worth investing in. And having the occasional or frequent um, indulgent sort of uh, erotic mental fantasy mm -hmm. about another person or another situation tends to speak more to where your mind goes and what, you know, it's almost sort of like the, the you know, the chorus of monkeys in your head who just distract you with stuff. It right. doesn't necessarily have a deeper meaning unless it has a deeper meaning for you. Right. And so there is no consensus, you know, the data and the research don't show any consensus that if you think about your ex, it means that you need to go back to them. There is no definite, uh, you know, cause and effect there. Right. If it's an obsessive thinking thing about your ex that you can't mm -hmm. stop thinking about them and you're obsessed with them, that's, again, that's different yeah. from a sexual fantasy. And I really, I guess I really want folks to start allowing themselves permission to make those distinctions between what's an erotic fantasy, what's an obsessive thing that I'm still hung up on my ex and I, and I need to get back with them and then, you know, what is it about? And the other thing too, you know, about sex fantasies is that they're fantasies. They exist only in our mind and so we have total control of everything. You know, we are, we are completely at once you yes. know, submissive and in control, desired and desiring, you know, it's yes. all of those things. And, and I think that's what makes makes fantasies right. so appealing because it, it, all, it just works out exactly in your favour every single time, unlike real life sex. Well, yeah. Which often does not. Right. <laughs> and that brings us to our next question, which is do we try to make – are fantasies a reality or are they better left in our minds without coming to fruition? Yeah. That really depends yeah. on the people involved. <laughs> it depends on what the fantasy is. It depends on, you know, uh, consent and so many other things. And so it's really helpful, I think, for folks who want to start exploring fantasies, depending on what they are, to have a contingency plan, especially if it's something a little bit edgy, you know. And edgy might be rough sex. Edgy might be bringing in another third, fourth, fifth, sixth person. Edgy oh, might be – or even, yeah, <laughs> you know? it could just – yeah, it could be anything, you know. Right. Um, in, if it feels edgy by your definition of edgy, so there's no collective agreement of what edgy is, edgy for you. Mm -hmm. Have a little contingency plan. Have a discussion with your partner before the event, like days before, not just two minutes before. Yeah. Days before the event, so you've got time to both really get into it and think about it, about what will we do if this works out really well? What will it mean for us, potentially? And what will we do if this perhaps brings up something a bit uncomfortable and unexpected? What kind of agreements can we make prior you know, in our in our sort of sane mind. And what I mean by that is when you start getting horny and when you start getting turned on, you know, your sex brain can sometimes take over a bit and you're, you're inclined to make decisions and, and agree to things that perhaps when you're, you know, more sane, for want of a better <laughs> phrase, you wouldn't necessarily say yes to. You're, there's actually been research done that the more horny and turned on you are, the more likely you're going to yield and, and say yes to something that you later go, oh, what did I do that for? Yeah. So that's why it's important to have these discussions, you know, in the cold, hard light of day um, yes. and make agreements around what happens if it goes well and agreements around what happens if it doesn't go well. How will we manage it? So, you know, will we talk about this just with ourselves? Do we have a friend who's really into this maybe that we can draw on to, to talk us through it later on? Um, do we have a, a counsellor or a therapist we can talk to? Do we have an online community that we can go and write about it with? Um, you know, just to sort of have a little contingency plan in the event we need to change, alter something. Um, 
and you know to 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 practice sort of being with the notion that it, it's, sex can sometimes bring up things unlike itself. Yes. So it can bring up things that are not always pleasant. It can bring up things that are a bit confronting about stuff that we didn't even know was there. Right. You know, right. like you, sometimes you just don't know what you don't know. Um, so it's if it feels like it's going to be an edgy thing, just have a little contingency plan in place. And that also the the benefit of that too is that it helps both partners or all partners yeah. feel safe going into the interaction that everyone's been able to to say what's on their mind and it doesn't need to be a big heavy processing thing yeah. but I think one of the things that folks tend to uh, make errors in is thinking that you know sex is natural and that because it's natural when it's when it's right everything just works out yeah. and well, lots you know, of things time, are natural and <laughs> right you know, <laughs> you know time I mean? and time again we know that that really for sex just doesn't work. And so, you know, this new kind of consent forward sex positive view is let's talk about sex like it matters. Right. You know, and, you know so. <laughs> oftentimes too, if it's a big fantasy or a big idea that you're bringing up with your partner, taking little steps to get to that fantasy I think is a really good idea. So if yeah. you have this fantasy of going to a dungeon and being whipped and mm. restrained, you know, that's a lot to take in. Yeah, <laughs> really. So yeah. maybe they start with a little handcuff. Maybe they start with a little spanking and then sort of Lama's birth as it were oh. <laughs> um, into, into uh, the, you know, and see, see if maybe that's enough even. Yeah. Sometimes people go that far and then they go, you know what? I'm good. I don't have yeah. that fantasy anymore. Or yeah. I really do. I really do. You know, you yeah. learn more about your likes and your dislikes so yeah. anyway mm. anyway anyway yeah i agree um now here's one uh is it normal for you to never fantasize mm. yes it, it is but i also think that sometimes we think that fantasies are these elaborate romance novel style um you know epic yeah. dramas or, a fantasy you know, is that you know yeah right i mean a fantasy is you know dreaming about finishing work so you can go out and have a cocktail i mean that's a fantasy right <laughs> um like, <laughs> you know uh, finding your dream apartment is a yeah. fantasy so i mean i think sometimes we tend to overemphasize the the heavy erotic element of fantasies when fantasies really can just be another word for imagination. Mm. So when folks say, I don't have fantasies, I mean, maybe you don't have really explicit erotic fantasies, sure, but I'm going to run on the assumption that you still have, you still daydream, you still have imagination, you still think about, oh, you know, I can't wait to have, you know, my favorite pasta for dinner. Like that's things that, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, the, the, just forward projecting ideas yeah. of how life might be nicer and more, you know, comfortable. That's yeah. still a fantasy. So an erotic fantasy doesn't have to be, a really elaborate thing. It can be something as simple as, um, you know, I just, I like the smell of my partner's T-shirt. Right. You know. Um, yeah, and in fact, you know, a uh, little self-disclosure, I don't tend to fantasize about anything while I'm having sex. And hmm. I think as I was coming up in this world of sex, uh, I felt like I was other because it, it seemed like everyone was talking about, you know, when I'm having sex with my partner, I'm thinking about, um, I'm thinking about her on a, on a horse and with flowing red locks, or I'm thinking about him fucking me on, you know, the last car of the train. I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, but that is also, that's also normal too. And that yeah. can just be the way your brain is and the way you are at that moment, or you'll grow into something. It's all, yeah. it's all natural, natural. Yeah. Yes, yeah. it is. It's all natural. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it's all normal. So the scale of, of fantasy from, um, you know, fantasizing about clean sheets through to fantasizing about something that's, you know, 
kind of edgy and wild. Mm -hmm. It all exists on a spectrum. And for different people, your scale of normal mm -hmm. is really unique to you. Yeah. So what's your version of edgy and your virgin, vir, virgin? version even of normal? <laughs> that's a, that's a, another fan, yeah. isn't it? For some. Um, yeah. Is, is really it's really unique to individuals so we cannot collectively say this is good and this is bad when it yeah. comes to fantasies okay mm. um uh should i tell my partner about my fantasies i think that's what you were talking about earlier is yeah. sitting some sitting your partner down and in another room way before you having sex and and divulge that and uh and open up that sort of well of communication, correct? Yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, I think for me personally, I'm a little bit on the fence about disclosing fantasies mm -hmm. because, because it can go really well mm -hmm. and then for others it can go really poorly. So, you know, I think back in the old days with sex therapy they used to say, you know, you should always share your fantasies with your partner and, and let them into your world. But if you know that something that you're into and your partner is just not into it, what what happens then? Yeah, you know, it, it's a good point. Yeah. yeah, you know, that you can, you can, I mean, again, the nature of fantasies is that it's for your benefit. You get to right. control it. It happens in your head. So you can indulge in it as much as you like. Mm -hmm. And if by sharing it with your partner and your partner is horrified or disgusted, what effect might that have on your relationship to your fantasy, first of all? Mm -hmm. What effect would that potentially have on your relationship with your partner, second of all? Mm -hmm. And I'm always curious about what is the incentive to share with a partner? Is it to create intimacy? Mm -hmm. Is it because you want to act it out? Mm -hmm. Is it because you want your partner to know something about you? There's lots and lots of different reasons that we might be inclined to share fantasies with our partners. And it's again, it's helpful to, to think about, well, what's my motivation for doing this first? Because if I want them to affirm and approve what I say and they don't, then what am I going to do? Right. On the flip side, withholding this information and being kind of secretive about it might get your partner offside anyhow because they'll think, well, what is it that you're fantasizing about that you don't want to share with me? Don't you trust me? So we go back into this thing of having the contingency plan. What, what are our agreements going to be around what happens if you hear something that you don't like? Yeah. What are we going to do then, you know? And this is where it becomes a much more comprehensive uh, skill set, you know, around emotional intelligence, erotic intelligence, being able to talk about stuff that brings up feelings that make us feel uncomfortable. And sometimes that's how it is. Now, if you have a partner who shares your erotic vision, you know, and you already know that kind of stuff about each other, then, of course, by all means, share the fantasies. It's a fabulous thing to do. But if you know you're on this page and you suspect your partner is on a different page or definitely not on your page, mm -hmm. then it might not necessarily be a practice that's going to be good for you and your relationship. And, you know, if, if the incentive is to create intimacy, there's a lot of different ways you can create intimacy. Fa sharing fantasies is only one way, so it doesn't mean that you're not going to be able to have a connection. It just right. means that, that that style might not be your style. Yeah. Mm. And I think also what I got to when asking people to send in questions is really people just want to know that it's okay to fantasize, that they're normal. Yeah. That they're, you know, because there are some people that might be disturbed about what they fantasize about. And this is right. the whole, you know, we could go into this in a bigger in a bigger way when we talk about, you know, porn and uh, the people thinking that porn sort of makes you think in a certain way. And, and yeah. so I think it's, I think it's important to tell everybody that it's in your head and you have control over it and it's, it's there to titillate you. And mm -hmm. um, as long as nobody's getting hurt, 
and there's consent, mm -hmm. um, then and am I wrong? Is then I would say it's it's fine, right? Yeah, I mean absolutely, and that's the thing. I think you know, and certainly for a lot of a lot of folks of of multiple genders, you know, who who perhaps have fantasies about sort of you know quite rough things or things that they think, gosh, you know, that's that makes me feel a bit icky in real life, but in my fantasy world, I find that really hot. Mm -hmm. That's really normal yeah. to have a gap between what you fantasize about and what you actually want to do in real life, those things don't have to be the same. Mm -hmm. And that's perfectly fine, you know. For some people, our fantasies are a way to help us process some sort of unresolved feelings or, or un, unmet, you know, um, emotional needs mm -hmm. that may or may not have anything to do with sex even. That's the thing about mm -hmm. fantasies is sometimes at, they don't actually represent what they seem to be at face value. So, mm -hmm. you know, explorations of gender perhaps or explorations of power or explorations of, um, you know, consensual non-consent and these kinds of things often speak to to other aspects of our lives that don't necessarily have an outlet. So that's one of the benefits, I think, of fantasies is that you really get to explore your edges in ways that you would never necessarily do mm -hmm. in real life. And, and it's a really safe way to explore those emotions and longings mm -hmm. that can be really enjoyable and really healing for people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. Yeah. Um, let's see what else. Uh, I think that was sort of it because I kind of melded it to this next yeah. one is about dreams, but that's different than fantasies. Yeah, I mean, I think with dreams we have less control over, like dreams yeah. sort of just happen by themselves. But I mean, sex dreams can, it sort of it comes into it a little bit too, but um, having dreams about things again, doesn't necessarily, it's it's not necessarily a literal interpretation. Sometimes it can just be, it can be speaking to a dynamic, it can speak, be speaking to an energy that, you know, depending on who you're with and what you're doing. And I mean, sometimes people have sex dreams about people that they despise. Yeah. And then, <laughs> and then when they wake up and they're like, ew, you know, I would never with that person. Yeah. So this, it, yeah. often the people who appear in our dreams aren't actually who we think they are. They're, they're aspects of either other parts of ourselves or unresolved. Again, a lot of unresolved feelings. And the, the relationship between sex and emotion is so visceral and so rich that um, – you know, it, I mean, that's certainly at my end of the spectrum as a sex therapist, that's the realm that I, I play in. And sometimes not everybody wants to go that deep, but that's sometimes where that can end up, um, which I think is really interesting. But, it is interesting. And yeah. if anyone wants to work on dreams and specifically, there's um, a gal named Anne Hodder Ship who does yes. dream interpretation and, and dream work. Um, and so she's on Instagram. Uh, the Anne Hodder, H O D D E R, um, and that's kind of that's kind of it. Um, okay. That's what, what, Do that's we what have any about. comments here in the? Porn helped me get better at sex. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um. Let's see here. Um. Don't understand that one. Um. Someone said my fantasy does not match what I desire in my actual sex life. So it's so. So true. yeah, other that's people, very common. Other people very so, very yeah. common. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, I think that might be it. Someone from Australia. Good day from Mornington Peninsula, wherever that is. Oh, that that's where I grew up, Mornington oh. Peninsula. Good day. I don't know who you are. I can't see, but hello. Ah, awesome. <laughs> I grew up on the Mornington Peninsula. That's my it's turf. Too. Yeah. It sounds very lovely. It's very uh, wet. Oh. 
I could, uh, there's a ocean, there. ocean on both sides. Yeah, sure, sure. I, my brain is a 14 year old boy. Really, just, That's just perfect. shake it, then it'll come out with something that is infantile. Infantile. Excellent. Um, all right, so, um, so you can find Cindy at uh, Cindy underscore Darnell uh, yep. on Instagram, cindydarnell.com. That's Cindy with a Y and an I at the end. And you can find me here, VL Chase, uh, on all the social medias and lchase.com. Next week, um, I don't know what we'll be doing, but we'll be doing something fun. We'll be doing something fun. Let us know. Send us little yeah. doodads. Tell us if there are any themes that you want us to cover because, yeah. uh, you know, we just we just make it up as we go along That's like right. you do. We're just sitting so. here. <laughs> I'm looking for a reason to put makeup on. Um, I actually feel like myself right now. Um, all right. Thanks, Cindy. Nice to see you. Nice go to back see you. to go back to your afternoon. I've got to dash out and do some things that are slightly fantastical and slightly practical. Oh, so that's oh. my afternoon. But at least we've got well, at least we've got springtime here in New York now. It's sunny and fabulous. Yes. Oh, that is nice. That is nice. All right. Bye. Bye, Goodbye. everybody. Thanks for tuning Thanks in. Thanks for coming in. All right. Bye. Bye.